Hi there. In this uh, A2 revision session, we're just going to focus a little bit, just for 10 minutes or so, on the big debate about the fiscal austerity introduced by the UK Conservative government and, where, and the arguments for and against fiscal austerity at this stage of the economic cycle. Here's the breakdown of government spending in the UK uh, last year. The biggest single item of spending is welfare or social protection, £230 billion a year. The biggest single item of departmental spending on goods and services is the health service, £140 billion. Education, defence and transport. Uh, crucially, of course, the government spends over £600 billion a week just on interest on the national debt. A sizeable figure. If you look at government spending, not just in terms of pounds and pence, but as a share of GDP, Government consumption here is in blue as a share of GDP. That's that's basically recurring spending. Things like salaries of nurses and doctors in the NHS, resources actually used up in the armed forces, in education, in local authorities. It's consumption of goods and services, basically public and merit goods, essentially. If we add in the investment, that's capital spending by the state, infrastructure spending, for example, on flood defence schemes and new motorways and the school building project, then we can see that government spending as a share of GDP peaked at about 26%, current plus investment spending, and has been falling quite sharply since, of course, as fiscal austerity has set in. The gap between government spending and revenue is shown by this chart. So in 2010, there was a £150 billion shortfall between spending and revenue, and that, of course, is the budget or the fiscal deficit. That deficit has gradually, slowly been declining, and the government is hoping by the end of this decade to have either balanced the budget or actually to be running a small surplus. The main reason for that, of course, is that uh, spending has been controlled. You can see how the slowdown in spending here and tax revenue is growing, partly because the economy is in the upturn phase of the cycle. This is perhaps the most important chart. It shows government spending in orange just here of GDP. That's all government spending, including welfare. Uh, and in blue, it shows total tax revenues, the so-called tax burden, lumping together all of the direct and indirect taxes the government takes in from VAT, from national insurance, from income tax, corporation tax, etc. And it's quite important to note that since the start of the recession, the tax burden has stayed more or less the same, dipped a little bit in the three or four years ago, but since then it's been rising. So there have been some tax increases, but the main reason why the deficit is falling uh, is because of quite deep cuts in government spending as a share of GDP. And that is forecast to accelerate in the next few years until we get to 2019, 2020, 2021, when the government's hoping to run a budget surplus. The key really is that government spending for many, many years has been above 40% of GDP, and the Conservative government really want to get that down. Right or wrongly, that's their aim. Now, it's important to make a distinction between debt and deficit. The deficit is shown in column two here. This is the public sector borrowing requirement, how much the government has to borrow each year. You can see the deficit peaked at 10% of GDP in 2009, 2010, has been falling gradually since. It's now below 5% of GDP, although, of course, the government's only run six years of surpluses since 1970. The national debt, on the other hand, is the accumulated debt of government uh, yet to be repaid and the national debt has increased from for just under 40 percent of the year before the crisis to now over 80 percent so there's been a doubling in the size of the national debt as a share of gdp now that 80 percent is interesting if you compare it with this chart which shows government debt the highest government debt in the world in 2015. japan has a level of national debt of over two and nearly two and a half times their income Greece, of course, a country you'll be familiar with, extremely high national debt, more than one and a half times their annual GDP. But all of these countries, including the United States, have very high levels of debt, including Italy, of course, another struggling Eurozone member. One of the issues is not just the level of debt or the size and scale of the debt, but how much does it cost a government to borrow and when it needs to inject fresh debt into the economy. So we look at something called bond yields, the rate of interest on a 5 or 10 or 20 year bond. And again, Greece is an outlier here. They, they've already had two, possibly three bailouts. They've partially defaulted on some debt already. And it's likely they may well miss another repayment. So the Greek government can only borrow at fairly high rates of interest by historical standards. In fact, that figure has now come down. But if they want to borrow for 10 years, 
it's going to cost them more than 7%. Other countries can borrow more cheaply, including Italy and the United States. Uh, and also look at Japan and Germany. They can borrow for 10 years, their governments can borrow for 10 years at less than half a percent per year yield. That is extremely cheap money. Yields have been falling. Indeed, for the UK government, likewise, although we have a high national debt and we've struggled to bring down the deficit, at the moment in the bond markets, the UK government can borrow quite cheaply. This is a key valuation point. Indeed, going to the exam, you can say they can borrow for 20 years at a yield of 1.5%, just under 2% for 10 years. So 2.5% for 20 years, 2% for 10 years, and they can borrow for less than 1.5% for five years. So the 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 bond yields for the UK government are extremely low. Uh, partly that's because global bond yields have been falling. There's been a fear of deflation in many countries. Uh, indeed, seven of the Eurozone countries are now in deflation. There's a global glut of savings, which is driving down bond yields because there's a, like an excess supply of savings. Quantitative easing, the central bank purchases of debt, has also driven down the yield. So we live in a world where yields on 20-year debt are particularly low. Is this the right time to be borrowing more money to fund important infrastructure? The coalition, 2010 to 2015, followed by the current Conservative government since last year's election, have been following a policy of fiscal austerity, although quite a bit of it has been parked a bit further down the road for the next two or three years. So there has been fiscal austerity, attempts to reduce the deficit, most of that has come from quite deep cuts in real government spending. On defence, for example, local authorities, um, education has suffered, healthcare is largely ring-fenced, although rising population is putting the NHS under more pressure. So key elements of fiscal austerity have been deep cuts in real spending uh, and some tax increases, national insurance for employees went up, VAT went up to 20%. And a couple of years ago, the government brought in an annual welfare cap. Families can only claim up to £26,000 a year in total in welfare. That cap is coming down. It's going to be gradually squeezed as the years go on. So there has been fiscal austerity. Equally, there have also been some tax cuts. Corporation tax has come down, although I think the big issue there is tax avoidance, not the rate of tax. The government has increased the income tax free allowance, for example, to try and improve work incentives. And I think I would favour this. They cut national insurance paid by employers who take on some long-term unemployed workers. So there have been some tax cuts to leaven the austerity, but not many. The government's also been helped by quantitative easing because the Bank of England's purchases of debt have helped to bring down long-term interest rates, which means that the government's debt interest payments have also fallen. Now, the government's introduced a rather bizarre new fiscal rule. I'm not sure whether this will last many years, but the government wants a budget surplus by 2019-2020 and it's targeting our budget surplus for all subsequent years when in normal times. Now normal times for some people means a full economic recovery, the output gap closes, that's one definition. The Treasury say that the economy will be viewed as being in normal times if real annual growth of GDP is above 1%. That's a bit strange because the trend growth of GDP for the UK is closer to 2%. So maybe the Treasury knows something that we don't know about the future growth of the economy. But the main point of this revision session is to think just for a few minutes about whether austerity is good for a country such as the UK. Austerity, don't forget, is a deliberate attempt to bring down the size of the deficit so that debt can be controlled and eventually the debt level as a share of GDP can fall. And you can see that there has been some progress in cutting the deficit, but it's taken many years to get the deficit under control. The forecasts for 2019-2020 perhaps are a little optimistic. So what are the arguments for cutting the deficit? What are the arguments for austerity? These arguments are essentially put forward by what is known as fiscal conservatives. They believe that government should spend less and tax less and borrow less. So the arguments are, first of all, that reducing the debt is in the long run interests of the economy. In particular, it helps to keep taxes lower in the future than they would otherwise be. The argument is that current taxpayers shouldn't burden future generations for taxes uh, to fund spending that helps them today. Secondly, fiscal conservatives believe in a smaller state. 
they think that if the state becomes smaller as a share of GDP, then the private sector is more likely to flourish because resources are freed up and because interest rates on private sector debt come down. They also point to the huge opportunity cost of spending £600 million a week purely in debt interest. If you could save £100 million a week, for example, that could go fund increased education spending, healthcare, or better local authority services. They also argue that cutting the deficit would help to restore confidence, particularly investor confidence in the UK, and therefore might make the UK more attractive to in with FDI. And a subtle but important argument is point five, that the upturn of the cycle, in other words, the recovery phase of the economic cycle, is the time for the government to borrow, not, borrow less, not more. Because at some point in the future, there will be another recession, and the UK doesn't need to go into the next recession with a sizable deficit. They point to the example of Germany, which in 2008 had a modest budget deficit, indeed close to a balanced budget, and in that country in 2008-2009, they were able to use expansion in fiscal policy, including a temporary employment subsidy, to help control unemployment. If you like, running a budget surplus can act as a sort of macroeconomic buffer stock against future downturns or, ex or external shocks. So there were five arguments for you about cutting the deficit. You'd expect me to throw back five arguments the other way. And these arguments were essentially put forward by Keynesian economists who believe that fiscal policy has a key role to play in driving macroeconomic variables. So the first argument is that fiscal austerity is actually self-defeating. Indeed, it can lead to the deficit getting worse, not better, particularly if fiscal austerity is a factor helping to bring about deflation, falling prices, which then damages competitiveness, damages growth, tax revenues, uh, revenues and profits of firms, and can lead to falls in, falls in real wages. They argue, secondly, that if you look at bond yields, as we've seen, they're very low at the moment. This is an opportune moment for the government to borrow more, not less. Particularly, point three, investing in infrastructure, flood defence, new motorways, new schools and hospitals. Particularly, invest in infrastructure which could generate a high economic and social rate of return, which, of course, can actually then create more tax revenue. The, conservative, the critics of the austerity argue that it's wrong, ill-advised, to cut government spending when the economy is in a liquidity trap. The liquidity trap is when very low interest rates, uh, expansion in monetary policy, really is failing to kick-start demand, output, uh, profits and investment. Indeed, they argue that economic growth is what's really driving deficit reduction. You need growth to pay back the debt and that fiscal austerity uh, makes this much harder to achieve. This would be, I feel like, a Keynesian critique of fiscal austerity. Here are some key terms. You might want to press the pause button on the video if you want to define some terms. I think the key confusion that students often make is between deficit and debt. So I'd make sure you're really clear on those definitions ahead of a fiscal policy question. So lots of economics here, the economics of fiscal austerity. I'm sure if you get a question on the exam, you'll do well. Thank you and good luck.